Julie Motkowitz is the Education Coordinator for Fru Land and Water Trust, where she has worked for over two years. She is a 10-year Florida resident and has a Bachelor of Arts degree in Environmental Studies from Florida Gulf Coast University. Julie loves teaching, learning, and being outdoors, but her particular interests are entomology, botany, and making jewelry from the items she finds during her outdoor adventures. I was so excited about this opening slide <laughs> with this cool gift. Um, this is one of the plants, <clears throat> the background here is one of the plants we'll talk about today. Um, so before I get started, I wanted to talk just a little bit about crew. In case you, anyone is unfamiliar, <clears throat> um, the Crew Land and Water Trust, we are a private nonprofit conservation organization dedicated to the preservation and stewardship of the water resources and natural communities in and around the Corkscrew Regional Ecosystem Watershed. So the crew in our name is an acronym that stands for Corkscrew Regional Ecosystem Watershed. Uh, that watershed is 60,000 acres and it runs between Fort Myers all the way down to Naples. Um, it's owned by various partners. Um, the partner that I mainly work with is the South Florida Water Management District and FWC. Um, we all work in the same office and coordinate everything that happens within uh, the 27,000 acres of land that uh, the district owns within the watershed. Um, so that accounts for the four different trail systems we have, which are located here. <clears throat> um, we have two trail systems up off of Corkscrew Road. That is the Marsh Trails and the Cypress Dome Trails. And then C and D on the southern half of this map here is uh, Crew Flint Penn Strand and Bird Rookery Swamp. So those are the four trail systems that I get to work on and educate on, um, you know, some plant walks in, in real life on those uh, trails too. Um, I did mention that there's a couple other partners within here. So there's Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary here in the center. Um, that would be one of our partners, which is the National Audubon Society. We also work with um, Conservation Collier, um, LEAD 2020. So lots of different partners going on within, within the crew project. So here's our handy dandy map of that. <clears throat> um, all of the plants that I'll be talking about today are found at crew somewhere. So um, and in most of the slides, I point out where exactly you could find some of these cool plants. Um, but all of these have been cited on crew land, at least by myself, if not more people. So with that being said, um, I wanted to talk about plants that use alternative sources of food. So um, most of the plants I'll be talking about today, they still do require some of uh, um, photosynthesis, but lots of them use other sources of food to supplement their photosynthesis. So as we may know, most plants draw their food from nutrients or draw their food and nutrients from the soil and the sun using their roots and leaves. Um, however, because our planet is so cool and ever evolving and adapting, um, there's some cool plants that have fit niches where they can actually utilize other sources of food. Um, most of most of the time is an adaptation to a lack of resources in their ecosystem. Um, so they're able to just fill an additional niche. <clears throat> so some plants, for example, um, adapt to heat by limiting their leaf surface area. Um, other plants adapt to limited sunlight by increasing their leaf surface area. Um, the carnivorous and parasitic plants I'm talking about today um, maybe seeking additional source of, sources of food so that they can grow in areas of low nutrients, like I mentioned. Um, so it just supplements their diet with other sources of food, which is pretty neat. So my first group of plants I'll be talking about today um, are these pretty little ones here. Um, so these are several different species that are found again in Southwest Florida. I wanted to really focus on carnivorous plants of Southwest Florida. Maybe we've heard about the pitcher plants that grow in Florida. Um, we don't really see these as far south as we are here um, at Crew. So I wanted to really hyper-focus on our local carnivorous flora. Um, so again, here's my first grouping of them. These are, all these plants are in the same genus. Um, and they're an aquatic plant, so they are the bladderworts. So they are all in the same genus, Utricularia. 
Um, and each of them uh, are a little bit unique, but they all have this really cool unifying um, characteristic that I'll talk about. Um, so here is a beautiful picture of some Utricularia, um, the horned bladder wart over at Flint Penn Strand. It's really neat. This one is just has a really cool looking flower. Um, you can see that horn sticking out from the flower there, hence the name. Um, and they will grow in areas that seasonally flood. So it's kind of interesting. Maybe if you're familiar with bladder wart, you usually associate them with um, areas that are flooded pretty much year round that are always wet. Um, horned bladder wart and some of the other bladder warts uh, have a, a bit of a tolerance to drier periods in the year as well. So for example, this horned bladder wart, this was in a big patch of area that um, had recently dried down uh, um, at Flint Penn Strand on our northern yellow trail. And um, they were just blooming like crazy. It was just one big patch of these really cute yellow flowers. And the picture is, is um, pretty close up and personal. These flowers are only about maybe the size of your um, thumbnail, but they were in such large numbers that they created such a big yellow patch. It was really beautiful. So if you want to check out some of these bladder words, um, Flint Penn Strand would be a good spot although they, they can be found in most of our trails. <clears throat> so, as I mentioned, they usually frequent wet areas. So freshwater wetlands, um, such as ponds, canals, and marshes. Um, these horned bladder warts were in an area that was pretty marshy that had just recently um, dried up, but they can be found in ditches and maybe even some swampy areas, um, but mainly, places that don't have uh, water that's really moving too much. Um, we have several species of Utricularia in Florida. Um, so here are four of the most common in our area that I've seen, um, and they all have, you know, a unique characteristic. All four of these are pictured on my previous slide. So we have the horned bladderwort, which is the background to the slide. We have a really beautiful purple bladderwort, um, also pictured on the last slide. Um, the floating bladderwort is really neat looking. It has this, it has modified leaves at the base of its flowering structure that is kind of like a little pool noodle around it um, that keeps it afloat in the water on top of the water columns that the, the flower stays above the water, which is really neat. And then we have the leafy bladderwort. Um, so several species. Uh, Utricularia is the uh, most widespread genus of carnivorous plants in the world, I found, which, which is pretty neat. Um, so maybe that's why we boast so many species here, because they're just so generally diverse. Um, so the main draw for bladderwort, maybe you're wondering where the heck is that name coming from, or you know what makes this carnivorous? It just looks like a cute yellow flower to me. Um, bladderwort uses bladder-like traps to vacuum up aquatic organisms that pass by. So um, in a previous picture, actually I think I have it up here in a second, um, there's little bubbles along the um, mass of the body that floats in the water of the, the bladderwort, and those are all bladders. So that's where the name comes from, and it's, they're just like little tiny air pockets um, that are reactive to movement, and those are um, technically the little mouths of the bladderwort's uh, plants. So um, it's really cool. The response time is less than one five hundredth of a second. So some of the most reactive um, response times in nature, which is pretty, pretty darn cool. Um, so here I have a picture and a little video. So on the left, that is the, uh, it's actually the leaves and the main body of the bladderwort um, bladderwort doesn't actually have roots, um, so the floating masses you see in the water, they are floating plants, so they're never rooted in any, um, well, at least this, this specific species, they're never quite rooted in sediment. If they are sitting in sediment, it's just their leaf and their um, bladderwort spread out. Um, so as you can see, all those little bubbles within that, that uh, mass, those are all the little bladders. And then here, this video, shows a uh, microorganism just floating on by this bladder and getting sucked up, which is, if you look, you can really see that, that quick reaction time. There's little hairs that surround each uh, bladder that when they are triggered by movement, that's what triggers the opening of the bladder. 
Um, the pressure inside the bladder is um, different from the pressure outside of it. So that's why it kind of creates that vacuum um, process there. And that's also why the reaction time is so quick. Um, I'm not always really savvy with Latin names, with the scientific names, but I do find it helpful to look into the etymology of them. So retricularia is Latin for a little bag, which is pretty easy to remember um, and rightfully named. Um, so that is bladderwort. Um, one of the first carnivorous plants I was made aware of in Southwest Florida and come to find out it's pretty widespread, which is really neat. Um, we see their flowers year round. They poke up from above the water. When you see the floating masses of the bladderwort in water, they look pretty fuzzy and, and pretty. And when you pull them out of the water, they kind of look less uh, intriguing like this picture. <laughs> but nonetheless, um, they, they do make a cool waterscape in those freshwater wetlands. All right, so our next plant is this cutie. Um, once again, we'll be talking about a genus of um, multiple species that we can find here in Southwest Florida. Um, this one is a terrestrial carnivorous plant um, and uses a different style, a different hunting style, if you will. So this one, again, um, can be found on the crew lands. We specifically see these often um, on the marsh trails. Um, which is characteristic for their, their habitat of choice. So this one is the butterwort. So pinguicula, I had to practice that one before today, pinguicula, um, that's the genus for the butterwort um, plants here in, in Southwest Florida. So several pictures here. Um, most notable is their leaves here that we'll talk about. They kind of form a basal rosette from which uh, usually a single flower will rise out of the center. Um, but if you look at this bottom right picture here, you can see a little poor ant stuck in that, that gooey leaf. Um, so that is the mechanism for hunting here that we'll talk more about. Um, the main species that we see at the marsh trails is small butterwort. And that is this purple flower um, pictured here. They're really cute. They're, again, a very small flower, probably only about, um, again, your thumbnail. Um, and they can be a, a range of colors. So we've seen them from white to light purple all the way to really dark violet purple. Um, so they can kind of range in, in colors of flower, which makes them really pretty. And we've seen little patches of them <clears throat> with that, that varying shade of purple, and it, it makes for a really pretty little um, side of the of the trail. It's where we often see them as the side of the trail. So let's learn some more about butterwort. <clears throat> um, so their habitat of choice is damp soils of pinelands and marshes. Um, so this is um, important to note because um, soils in pine ecosystems are often very acidic because pine needles are very acidic. So as they break down, um, after years and years, the soil becomes pretty acidic. So in an acidic soil, it can be hard to draw nutrients out of um, an area and can limit the amount of um, locally available nutrients. So I mentioned earlier that many carnivorous plants are adapted to a lack of resources in their ecosystem. So this would be a prime example of that. Um, these acidic ecosystems are hard to eat in. So our little pinguicula has found another route for um, feeding. <clears throat> so um, again, pinelands and marshes, the butterwort that we often see at the marsh trails is literally um, at the edge of a marsh and a pine flatwood. So exactly as described here, which is pretty cool. Um, we found this one just hiking by, noticed a cute flower one time and um, the more I learn about it, the more I'm amazed by it and how it, everything makes sense as to how we're observing it and where it's at. So <clears throat> we have, <clears throat> excuse me, two species um, local to our area that you can find at Crew specifically. So that first one, um, Pinguicula pumilla, is the small butterwort. And that one is the one we most often find at the Crew Marsh Trails and the purple one that's photographed here in the background. 
Um, and then there's also the yellow bladderwort. So same deal, just a little yellow flower. Um, and that one is also found at the marsh trails. Okay, so what's super neat about pinguicula or butterworts is that they trap their prey with a sticky butter-like mucus on their leaves. So the name comes from that greasy substance on their leaves that's kind of butter-like. And again, the etymology of uh, the genus epithet is that pinguicula is Latin for fat, meaning fatty or greasy, not like thick, but fatty and greasy, hence that buttery substance, the goo that's on its leaves um, that traps those animals. So here again, we can see a little ant that is living the life cycle, the food chain here, and supplying this butterwort with some alternative food source. Um, and you'll see here the plant does have, you know, green leaves, as we know and love many plants to have. Um, so it does conduct photosynthesis, but it um, supplements its diet with, with some insects. And the common theme amongst our carnivorous plants today <clears throat> is that um, they use digestive enzymes to actually break down the insects in um, invertebrates that they are eating. Um, so it's kind of like if we had our stomach acid that was really thick and didn't just, you know, wasn't just liquid. We had an inside out stomach and anything that, you know, touched our stomach and our stomach acid that would just kind of break down right on there and then it's able to absorb it from there. Um, some carnivorous plants, such as our bladderworts, will also have symbiotic relationships with um, tiny bacteria and other microorganisms that also help break things down for them. Because if you can imagine um, the breaking down of an insect um, is likely the hardest part of something that eats meat but doesn't have a mouth or a digestive system. So um, some of the carnivorous plants like pitcher plants and the bladderworts will have symbiotic relationships with um, bacteria and other invertebrates and microorganisms that um, help do that process for them. And then in turn are housed by the plant itself. Um, butterwort is not an example of this, <clears throat> but um, I think it makes it even cooler because it just does it all on its own. So that is our butterwort. Um, the butterwort flowers year round, so you can kind of see it pop up whenever. Um, I used to think it was a small margin of the year that it flowered, but that was just because I had just noticed it. <laughs> but come to find out, it does flower year round. Um, by the way, most of my fun facts today I gathered from some really great uh, field guides, which I'd like to share with you. I have my, my book here that's all marked up with my pages. This is one of my favorite um, wildflower books for our region. Um, sometimes it can be hard to use a book when it's like all the flowers of the southeastern U.S. This one is specifically Everglades wildflowers, so for South Florida, um, and I use this, this one every day. This is by um, Falcon Guide, specifically by Roger Hammer, and Roger Hammer actually does wildflower walks for us every year. I think this is coming up in a month or two, um, if you ever wanted to check out. Um, but that would be like with a, a real serious plant nerd. Um, you can always check our website under our programs list. But otherwise, this is my favorite field guide for everyone who is in the market for a new one. <clears throat> All right, so our next plant is this cutie. I'm so excited. This was one of my um, first interesting finds when I was working at Crew, just from wandering around and walking through water and stuff like that. Um, hence, or notice the color on this one, the reddish tone. Oftentimes when you see plants in nature that lack that classic green color, it may allude to um, its lack of photosynthesis. Therefore, um, maybe that it eats things other than sunlight and soil and water. <clears throat> so um, this one um, does still conduct a little bit of photosynthesis because it still does have some, have some green pigment in there, but um, you can tell that this one is likely conducts less photosynthesis than our butterworts that have those bright green leaves. Um, so this one is called the sundew. Did you guess it? You can see those little dew drops on their little fingers in the picture there. Um, the genus of this one is Drosera. 
And it, once again, there are several species that we can view in our area, um, specifically at Crewe. So I think these might be one of my favorites, sorry, butterwort and bladderwort. Um, the habitat of this one is damp soils of pinelands and marshes. So again, um, something that grows in acidic areas that needs to supplement its diet because of that harsh um, location that it lives in. So this one is really cool. Um, I've observed it near several marshes at Crewe. Um, what I've found is that they often grow in the margin of a marsh that uh, dries up eventually. So if you have a marsh that's this big and it dries up to this big, the sundew will grow in the margin that um, has since dried up. So they'll pop up usually during um, this time of year when things are really starting to dry down and the water levels are starting to drop. And they are pretty small and um, you don't really, you, can't, you don't notice them too much unless you get pretty close to the soil, but when they um, are really happy and once that water really dries down, they can create pretty, pretty big little thickets of themselves. And um, it's really the color that, that draws you in at a larger scale like that. But once you get close, look at how neat they are. They have all these little fingers and, and uh, dew drops. They also have pretty cute little flowers too. <clears throat> so we have two species um, local to us. So the one in the background pictured is pink uh, sundew. Um, that is the more common species, but come to find out the dwarf sundew um, is, is pretty uncommon, but we do see it often at Crew. So we have both of these species at Crew. They look pretty similar, um, but as you can probably guess, the dwarf sundew is a bit smaller. So already sundews, these uh, pink sundews are only about um, this big, maybe the size of a Publix cookie. Um, <clears throat> but the dwarf sundew are probably, um, can be about a quarter of that size. So they're, they're quite smaller, but again, they look very similar, that reddish color and all these spatulas with the little fingers with dew drops on them. <clears throat> so, oops. Sundew, sorry, I have a mistake in my PowerPoint here. Um, sundew captures its prey using those little dew drops on their um, leaves, as we can see. And um, this is actually the, the opening slide that I had, that gif of one kind of enclosing over a wasp. So I have some more cool um, gifs here. Again, Drosera is Latin for dewy, so applicable for sure. So here are some more cool gifs of that. Um, this is a species that will actually move and react to prey. So similar to our uh, bladderwort, there's a, an actual movement reaction that's happening. So the bladderwort is opening that vacuum to suck in their prey. The sundew is actually going to eventually curl over um, each of those little hands to uh, maximize the digestion, di digestion, process of the invertebrate that it's eating. So most of these plants will be eating small things like bugs that happen to walk over them or, or um, find their, their way to the plant. Sundew, um, the red color also helps to attract bugs because oftentimes in nature, red is the color of flowers and it means something sweet. Um, and the sundew can also be sweet to the taste. So um, between those two attractive qualities, bugs are just like, heck yeah, I want to get some of that sundew, but unfortunately often find their demise, but look at how cool the gift it makes. So, oh, well, I guess circle of life. <laughs> um, I really went crazy on these gifts. I thought they were so cool. <laughs> All right. So one more section of plants here. Um, so we've been talking about all of our carnivorous plants, but I also wanted to mention plants that use other sources of food as well. And that means parasites. So we do have parasitic plants here in Southwest Florida and throughout the world. Um, two of the most common are the ones I wanted to point out today. And you've likely seen at least one of them. Maybe you've seen both of them without even realizing. So it's gonna be one of those, one of those days where I show you something and then you know, for the next few months, you're gonna be like, wow, I see that everywhere now. Um, so the first one is mistletoe, um, one of my favorites. I um, was born the day after Christmas, so I always love the Christmas time 
And um, this is a picture of me. I found mistletoe out at Crew when I went camping for my birthday this past year. And um, I thought, wow, I need to learn more about this plant. I didn't even realize that we had mistletoe in our area. It's usually a plant that I associate with um, the north or just colder regions of the world or just Christmas. It's never been, you know, a tangible plant for me. Um, so we do have a native plant, a native mistletoe, um, several species throughout North America, and we do have um, a species that lives down here in Florida. Um, the genus is Phoradendron, and uh, it's a really interesting plant. It's once you once you have an eye for it, you can kind of spot it, but before you really learn about it, you're like, what the heck is going on? So it's interesting. The mistletoe um, looks like it's just an additional branch growing out of a plant. Um, the mistletoe in this picture is growing on, on a pop ash tree. Um, as far as I understand, they most often parasitize oak trees. Um, so this is a bit different, I guess, just a Florida version of mistletoe, you know, growing on a tree that grows in the swamp. Classic. Um, but what's interesting is that it'll uh, spread itself, um, you know, using those seeds, it'll take root on a, another plant, uh, usually a tree. And what its goal is, is to root into the tree and actually tap into um, the growth ring of the tree uh, where it can suck the nutrients out of the tree. So again, parasitic. Parasitic meaning that um, it, it does cause a negative impact on its hosts. And um, if there's too many, too much mistletoe, it can definitely cause an issue for its host tree. But most often, because nature is so well designed in unison and balanced, that um, if there's you know checks and balances in an ecosystem, it shouldn't be too destructive to an ecosystem. Um, so again, it's it's interesting to look at because it just looks like another offshoot of a tree because it's so well rooted inside whatever it's growing on. Um, and so it does have those classic white berries that we think of when we think of holly, or excuse me, when we think of mistletoe and Christmas. Um, and then it has some striking foliage too. So again, once you train your eye to pick up that general pattern of mistletoe, um, you can kind of spot it as I did in this pop ash swamp. So um, I grew up in the Midwest and I, um, again, didn't associate these kinds of things with Florida or as additionally holly. You know, we have such an abundance of holly in Florida. So we have some fun Christmassy plants that grow here in Florida. Um, and I, I never knew that ho that uh, mistletoe was was uh, parasitic. So it's so funny we we celebrate this cool plant without even knowing that it's this crazy parasite. So fun fact for ya. And then our last plant today, last but not least, is love vine. So this one is super common in our area. Um, I think it looks like a bunch of spaghetti from far away. So that picture in the very top center is a great example of a thicket that it can create of itself. Um, so again, this one is a parasite. And I mentioned earlier that a color of a plant can kind of let us know a little bit more about what it's eating. So um, this one specifically is lacking a little bit of that green color. You can kind of see it's more yellowy or orangish, especially in this, this um, top picture. And that may cue us that it might clue us to know that it doesn't um, solely um, depend on photosynthesis for its food. So what this one does is that it just grows on top of other plants. It uses its body to just wrap around other things um, called a twine. It's a twining vine. And um, it has like little suckers that it'll um, produce that again, similar to the mistletoe, will kind of root into a woody plant um, until it gets to the xylem and the phloem and it'll actually suck the nutrients right out of it. So this one I think has more opportunity to be a bit more damaging because look at that picture on the top there that is like not only is it blocking out all the sun but it's you know also sucking out all the nutrients from whatever it's growing on. Um, but nonetheless creates a pretty cool landscape too and um, another interesting plant that is isn't just photosynthesizing and hanging out, it's actually doing some crazy parasite stuff. So um, scientific name of the love vine is Cassitha filiformis. 
Um, so again, it, it's just a bunch of tiny little tendrils, little spaghetti noodles <laughs> that grow over other plants and kind of suck the nutrients out of them. Um, so two parasitic plants that we can find in Southwest Florida. Um, I've seen just a few of these mistletoe at Crew, but I know a common area that you can find them is also um, Six Mile Cypress Slough. You can see them growing on the cypress trees, or is it, I think it's actually the Popash trees as well at, at Six Mile. But nonetheless, you can see them growing at Six Mile as well, um, all along the boardwalk, whereas at Crew, they might be a little harder to spot. Um, but yeah, those are our parasitic plants. Those are all the plants I have for you today. So again, I just like was having too much fun with these gifts, <laughs> but how appropriate. Um, this gift here is the flying or the Venus flytrap that we usually associate with the term carnivorous plant. Uh, we don't have those here in Florida, but as you've learned today, we have abundance of other carnivorous plants that in my opinion are way cooler. So take that Venus flytrap. <laughs> But anyways, um, thanks again for hosting me at Naples Preserve. And um, if you ever need to contact us or want to learn more about us, here's my um, email and our website. Our website has all the information you might need about crew, um, our trail locations and addresses and trail conditions and programs. Um, I am guiding a program in April called the When Bugs and Plants Collide. So if you liked the idea of um, what we talked about today. I'll be talking about even more um, yeah. bug and plant combination topics in that program in April, so definitely check that out on our website. Otherwise, thank you, and um, no, I'm going to... Uh... Oh yeah, is there some questions? Sure. Would you yeah. please repeat the name of your, uh, your book that you use so frequently? Sure, yeah, it's the Everglades Wildflowers. It's a falcon guide written by Roger Hammer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I can type, mm -hmm. I can probably send that in the chat too if that's easier. Okay. Right. Any other questions, anybody? I would say mm, probably the bladderwort. It's the most widespread throughout crew. So I've seen it at every single one of the trails um, growing in usually like ditches or some of the swampy areas. Um, so bladder work can be found all throughout the crew trails. That one would be the easiest to find. Um, the second easiest to find, I would say, is the butterwort because it has consistently just bloomed like crazy on the marsh trails. Um, near our pavilion, Suzanne's pavilion on the marsh trails would be a great um, marker for to find those. And they just grow alongside the edge of the trail and their foliage is kind of a lighter green so it sticks out amongst the darker green grass. Um, but yeah, the butterwort at the marsh trails and the bladderwort, wherever you find yourself, I'm sure you can find it. <laughs> It's kind of like um, when you apply things topically, you know, to your skin, um, it's able to absorb things through its skin okay. or its leaf skin. <laughs> and um, yeah, so the, the, the focus of breaking down the animal so that it breaks down to a small enough, um, small enough matter that it can then absorb it through the leaf. Come on. Watch your step. You never know when you're going to stumble into a carnivorous plant. <laughs> I forgot to mention, though, um, carnivorous plants are harmless to us, in case you were worried. I don't know if you were, but maybe. <laughs> but that's all, that's all I have today. Thanks again for having me. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. And now I don't have to worry about sticking my finger in one of those plants. Yeah. No, my favorite thing is to give them a little rub to feel <laughs> the butter in there. Yeah. <laughs> I still have all my fingers. Thank you.